Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Johanna Arendt, and I work with Travis County Natural Resources. And uh, really excited to have you guys here today. I have a special guest today, uh, Dave Morgan and Nancy Sandoval, who are both um, Travis County Balcones Canyonlands Preserve biologists. So they're going to be talking about the birds that we work together to uh, protect and all the wonderful work that they do to manage the habitat for those species. This Wild Neighbor Speaker Series is actually a collaboration between Travis County and the City of Austin, which together manage about 80% of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. Um, and so it's a great way for us to connect with folks who are interested in wildlife in the uh, Travis County area and also just um, spread the good word about all the wonderful wildlife we have here. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dave Morgan, who's going to kick it off with a presentation about golden sheep warblers. All right. Well, thank you very much, Johanna. Uh, yeah. Like she said, my name is David Morgan. I'm a biologist on the Travis County BCP. Uh, I've been doing warbler and vireo stuff since 2008, somewhere in there. So um, I enjoy doing it a whole lot. So I, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit today about what the golden cheek warbler is and what we do and uh, what we do on the BCP for this little guy. So uh, what is a golden cheeked warbler? If you live in Austin, you've probably heard of this guy. He's a little federally endangered songbird. Uh, he's about five inches. You know, he's about between the sides with titmouse and a chickadee. Uh, usually you're gonna hear them a lot easier than you're gonna see them. You're gonna really need to be out there with binoculars looking in the treetops to really get eyes on these guys. Uh, they're not a, they're not typically a bird you're going to find in your backyard unless you just happen to back up to a green belt with habitat or live uh, you know adjacent to the BCP. You're not going to see these guys at your bird feeders. Uh, they typically only eat insects and larvae and spiders and stuff like that. So um, just a little overview you know the golden cheeked warblers so they have a, a yellow face a black on their head and their back and they have a black beard. Uh, the females have very similar colors except usually they're just not as dark. Um, there'll be a lot of variation um, you know between how dark and how light you know males, males and females can be. You know females can look really dark. They can look like a young male uh, but typically you know that when they're dark black like that they're going to be a male and if they're singing that's usually a dead giveaway that it's a male. Uh, one of the lookalikes and similar birds that we get here in Central Texas is the black-throated green warbler. Uh, this guy down here on the bottom left. Uh, they look and sound a lot like the black, uh, golden cheeks. Uh, these guys don't nest here in Central Texas. They're usually just migrants passing through. Uh, but I see a lot of these guys. I hear them almost every day. Uh, they, they have the black beard. They have a lot of the same features as the golden cheek, but uh, you know, their back's gonna be a lot more olive colored. They don't get that dark black on their back. And also you can't see it on this picture, but they're gonna have some yellow on their vent underneath. Um, so golden cheek warblers, their breeding range, they breed exclusively here in Central Texas in Oak Juniper Woodlands. Um, every single one of these guys is born right here in the great state of Texas. Um, but every year they migrate uh, south along the Sierra Madre Oriental and they winter in the Pine Oak uh, High Country down in uh, South Mexico and Central America. And the habitat here, uh, they, they only live in mature oak juniper woodlands, usually larger tracks, you know, 30 or 40, 30 or 40 acres is about the smallest chunk of habitat they're gonna use, usually, you know, larger the better. Uh, the older, more mature habitat, the better. Uh, this, this landscape shot here, the lighter colored trees that you can see are going to be your deciduous stuff, usually oaks, Texas oak. Um, and then the darker colored trees that you can see are going to be your ash junipers. Um, so the, now nesting, the female will build a small cup sized nest. Uh, you, usually it'll be up like in a, in a fork of a branch or often kind of near the trunk, just kind of tucked away, well hidden. They'll usually be up high. They'll lay three or four eggs, sometimes two, sometimes five, but typically three or four. Uh, the female will lay about one egg per day when she's laying. And she, they'll only make these nests out of mature old growth juniper bark. Uh, you know, typically they say about 40 year old or older juniper before it starts 
producing this really shaggy bark. Uh, and that's what they use to weave it all together. And then they use uh, like insect silk and spider webs uh, to, to bind it all together and then line it with grass or fur or feathers or whatever soft they can find. So kind of a timeline, the males show up, you know, early mid-March and they'll show up and start singing and start trying to stake out their territories that they're gonna have for the next couple of months. Um, a couple of weeks after that, the females will start showing up and the females will actually select their mate. They'll go from territory to territory until they find a male that they find suitable. And then, you know, after that, they'll go around together and they'll find a place that they want to build their nest. Um, it takes two or three days to build the nest. The female's the one that does pretty much all the building. Uh, after the nest is built, you know, they'll uh, hang out and copulate and for a couple of days before she starts laying. Uh, she'll spend about a day per egg laying. And then the female will also be the one sitting on the nest. The male doesn't really incubate. That female is gonna spend about 75% of her day uh, incubating those eggs while she's doing that. Now, after they hatch, all those eggs will hatch in about two days. And then the male and female will spend both, uh, spend time feeding those babies. Uh, you, Usually kind of the female does the bulk of it at first, but then the male kind of picks up as the, as the babies get older. Uh, we start seeing kind of the first fledglings leave the nest in late April. Um, and both those parents may continue to feed and care for those fledglings, you know, up for another four weeks or so. Um, now, during this time, if, if time and resources allow, uh, the adults will uh, attempt a second late season nest. Um, usually, you know, if they have a nest early, none of their nests get eaten or depredated or parasitized, you know, they'll, they, there's a pretty good chance they'll have a, uh, a late season second nest. Um, like I said, but if one of these nests gets, you know, eaten or destroyed by weather or whatever for some other reason, they pretty much have to start the whole cycle back over again. Uh, they won't reuse that same nest. They'll find a new nest location and rebuild and, and everything. Um, the vast majority of nesting is done by kind of mid-June. Uh, if, if they do have a second late season nest, you know, it may go past mid-June into kind of late June. Uh, but for the most part, you know, stuff starts winding down towards the beginning of June into May. Um, after they're done with nesting, um, you know, they'll take care of those, those fledglings for a couple of weeks. But for the most part, they're going to be just eating, building their fat reserves, getting ready for migration. And the adults are going to actually molt and get a new set of feathers before they migrate. And then starting in July into late August, they're going to start making the trip back south. So threats to the golden cheek warbler, you know, historically, um, you know, just clearing and logging of vast juniper, or as they say here locally, cedars. Uh, pretty much nobody likes juniper. There's been a lot of misinformation about cedar and juniper over the years. A lot of people don't even think it's native to central Texas, but I can, I can assure you it is. You know, there are areas, you know, farther west in the rolling in the rolling plains and stuff like that where cedar can be invasive, but you know, it gets a bad rap as a water hog, or you know, people can't raise livestock when they have a bunch of juniper on their property. So it just gets a bad rap and it gets cleared off by most people. But you know, today. You know, some of the bigger threats are more just residential and convert commercial development. You know, everybody wants to live on the top of a hill with a view, which is, you know, pretty much the prime gold cheek warbler habitat. Uh, and if you're keeping up with any of the Texas real estate, pretty much all central Texas seems like it's getting busted up into 5, 10, 20 acre ranchettes. And so that just creates more fragmentation, more roads, more pipelines, right of ways, utility easements, more development, uh, more disturbance. So you know, you know, back in the early 1900s, there was actually a, an ax, it's called the Kerrville Cedar Ax. That was, uh, I think it was developed for the full purpose of chopping juniper down. That's that picture. Here's kind of a snapshot in time of uh, about 1500 acres that we manage on the Travis County BCP. This first shot's from 1940. You can see that these darker areas of habitat, those are gonna be your kind of mature oak juniper woodlands. You can already see here in 1940 that a lot of this was cleared off even prior to 1940. This would this this little break right here would have actually been Lime Creek Road. This this is before Lake Travis was even built. That would have been the tail end of Lake Travis. 
Now here in 1980, you can see this, some of this was cleared for a second time. And a lot of this was just, you know, clear cut. Those areas that got clear cut on slopes and stuff, all the soil is just gonna get wiped away because it's just rocky limestone slopes. Um, and after that soil washes away, it's gonna take a long, long time to rebuild, you know, those layers back up and rebuild these areas where they can grow back in the woodlands. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like today. A lot of this has come back and is, is pretty decent warbler habitat, but you can still see some of these areas that got clear cut and um, that are still just thin. It's still after 40 years, just kind of pretty marginal habitat. It just takes forever to get uh, trees established on those eroded slopes. Uh, there was a paper that came out in, prior to listing in 1976 that was estimating at the current rate that, you know, oak juniper woodlands and suitable nesting habitat could be wiped out by the turn of the century. Luckily, that didn't happen. So, you know, other threats, oak recruitment's a big one. At one point in time, uh, white-tailed deer densities in central Texas were some of the highest in the country. You know, when you have that many deer, they're going to eat all the acorns, they're going to browse all the deciduous stuff first. It's hard to get any new trees growing if you have a very high deer population. Uh, on top of that, you know, feral hogs or goats or anything like that will, will eat up an acorn crop very fast. Uh, oak wilt is something that to worry about. And then, you know, fire and drought is always a concern. Uh, other issues with predation or depredation parasitism. Uh, tawny crazy ants are a relatively new uh, invasive to central Texas. Uh, they're a pretty big concern for us. There's only, we've only found them in a couple of spots on the BCP, but they're, they're actually arboreal foragers. So they'll actually go up into the trees to forage for insects. And so we're, we're pretty concerned about how they're going to affect the, uh, you know, native prey base, uh, all the insects up in the trees, um, you know, if they really take off in this area. Uh, Brown-headed cowbirds, they'll parasitize uh, warbler nests. Uh, you know, this area has become more urban, so, you know, we don't have so many cows and livestock in this area, so cowbirds aren't as big a problem here as they once were. But on the other hand, you know, with more urbanization comes stuff like blue jays, who can be very aggressive. I actually watched the blue jay pick off a golden cheek warbler uh, fledgling that was just a couple of days old a couple of years ago. He just picked them up, flew off with them, and ate them. Um, and they've been observed by some other people being very, you know, disruptive for, for warblers. Uh, some other threats, you know, we can't really control what goes on in southern Mexico and uh, Central America when it comes to wintering grounds or migration corridors. There's a lot of agriculture and, and, um, and lumber production down there, so that's always a big question mark. And then climate change is going to be the, the big question mark in the future. Uh, so what about us in the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve? You know, the BCP was created in 1996, and it was basically a community agreement between Fish and Wildlife Service and developers and, and everybody that allowed, you know, Texas is a private land state, and Austin's growing, it's going to continue to grow. Um, so in order to protect habitat, it's a community agreement that basically allows for developers to, to work with, um, to work with us in exchange for being able to uh, you know, potentially develop potential golden sheep warbler, warbler habitat. It's called incidental take. Um, it was, this uh, BCP was created for eight species, not just the warbler. Uh, it was for the black cat vireo, the golden sheep warbler, and then six additional uh, car karst invertebrates that live in uh, caves underground. So this allows us to kind of manage for an entire native ecosystem. So the BCP is one of the largest urban preserves uh, in the country. So right now it's over 32,000 acres, 50 square miles, and it has a bunch of different partners, not just the county and the city, but also uh, LCRA, Nature Conservancy, Audubon, as well as a bunch of other private land managers. Um, you know, when the BCP was created, uh, we also created a land management plan, which are basically guidelines for managing and monitoring on the BCP. Uh, right now, we, we do three different kinds of surveys for warblers every year. We do, you know, spot mapping for basically territory enumerations or delineations. Uh, we do some intensive monitoring plots, as well as uh, smaller presence absence surveys that we do in some marginal habitat or smaller areas that may be too small for an entire male's territory.
So what do we do when we go out in the field? Basically, we're trying to pick up behavioral clues of what is going on. Um, we collect you know, spatial points of where that bird is. Uh, we listen for counter singing. Uh, we wanna know how many males that bird's counter singing with. Um, we try to see if he's banded. Uh, we go in our intensive monitoring plots, we color band males so we can t differentiate them. Um, is, is he with a female? Do they look paired or is he just chasing her around or is she just you know scouting out? Um, if they're paired, what are they doing? Are they just foraging? Are they looking for nest locations? Are they building a nest? Are they carrying food? You know, all this stuff, we, we work together and have a lot of team communication between all different surveyors and basically put, put everything together, put the dots on the map, delineate territories, figure out where, where, how many males there are. And that kind of allows us to estimate territory densities in a specific space. And then the intensive monitoring plots, you know, we, we also try to find as many nests as we can. We try to figure out um, which males have females, which don't, which gives us kind of a pairing success, which males have babies, which gives us kind of a uh, uh, overall, you know, uh, productivity success. Um, this is kind of an idea of what the color banding looks like. We catch them in these big mist nets and then give them a unique color band combo. Um, it's kind of a skill in itself to be able to see the leg bands on these birds out in the field but you know once you kind of get it down it, it helps a lot uh, you can figure out if a male's outside of his territory uh, you know territories will overlap um, kind of gives you an idea of what female goes where whose babies belong to who uh, it's just a great tool and on top of that the males will return some males will return to the same territory year after year so Getting eyes on these bands year after year gives us ideas of return rates. If return rates are really high, that means you know maybe conditions on the on the migration routes and corridors and and winter and grounds are are good. If the return rates are really low, you know they may have had a rough winter. Um, some other stuff we do as far as managing and protecting habitat. You know we do a lot of invasive plant removal. Uh, to try to keep those native plants in the understory in the canopy. Uh, there is a brown-headed cowbird program. Uh, we've programmed to kind of manage deer levels at a sustainable uh, population levels. Feral hog reduction program. Uh, we monitor and control oak wilt. You know, if we find it, if we find it, we try to nip, try to eliminate it right there. Uh, as well as we create shaded fuel breaks to try to protect habitat from wildfire risk, you know, in our wildland urban interface. Um, now, looking to the, the future, climate change is going to be a big one. You know, a lot of research has shown that mature closed canopy forests are a lot more resilient to climate change. They have deeper, richer soils. They have cooler ground temperature, cooler understory temperatures. Um, they reduce runoff. They capture more water for aquifers and put it in, you know, in the water table. And overall, they typically just have higher biological diversity. We're actually starting a pilot program to try to restore some of our more degraded habitats with berms and swales to capture runoff and then actually replant, replant it with native plants. So I'm sure I'll have more on that uh, as soon as that project kind of kicks off more. But um, that's about it. Um, that's all I have. I'll, uh, there'll be time for questions later. Uh, if you have anything, uh, you can type them in the chat and we'll be sure to answer them here in a little bit. Stop sharing there. Okay, yeah, it looks like you've stopped sharing. So um, if Nancy, you want to go ahead and share your presentation. So my name is Nancy Sandoval, and um, this is my third bird season with the county. Um, and so I'll be presenting behind the music, the Black Cat Vireo. And throughout the presentation, I'll be referring to it as the four letter alpha code and it's just an abbreviation that's used as shorthand and that's i'll just say vireo but you'll see on my slides the bcvi okay so bcvi i will also refer to as a vireo so here we have the male vireo, 
He's got a black cap, a grayish nape, and it won't always have that grayish nape. Sometimes the black cap will extend all the way to the green back. And this is actually um, RGP, and he's banded red, silver, green, pink. And a lot of this, some of the information is similar to the golden cheeked warbler, but our extra fun vario thing is that we name them, and sometimes we'll name them silly names. And here is a video still that I have, and I'm going to play the song off my phone. Oh. Just so you have an idea of what they sound like. And so, of course, they seem to attract mates and defend territories. And then we have the female Vireo, and she's got, she's pretty much a, a, a duller version of the male. She's got the silly gray crown and also the green back. And she doesn't sing, but she'll, she'll make different calls. This is what we call shredding. And so they both have the, the white spectacles and the reddish eyes. And they're about the same size at four and a half inches. So that black cap doesn't make it a vario. Um, in this area, you'll see Carolina chickadees and you'll see those at the feeders. They, um, black caps do not uh, come to bird feeders, but they have the say, a similar diet of insects and spiders. And then, um, so they, like I said, they insects and uh, their larvae, caterpillars, beetles, small grasshoppers, and crickets and spiders. Um, their breeding range um, is Oklahoma, Texas, and there's parts of Mexico in here. Um, they begin arriving in mid March and by uh, and are nesting by April. Um, we've also had them um, nesting by uh, you know the end of March. Um, so the, they may nest and tend to their young in, um, in this breeding area. And then they begin their journey south in late summer. So they start leaving around July, August. We've had some as late as early September. Um, and then they, they winter on the Pacific coast of Mexico. So the <clears throat> habitat, they like the mix of tree heights, plus these open areas and scattered um, shrubs. Here's another photo. Um, and so they like these shrubs that are close to the grounds. Uh, and this is a mix of Chinook, Sumac, Ash, Persimmon. And then in, in the mix are these big oaks. We've got uh, live oak. There's also, uh, you know, Texas oak out on the, uh, on the preserve. And so they'll use these, um, these what we call shinnery. And this is just these dense thickets of shin oak. They use those for nesting. They like that low woody cover. And then the higher trees, they'll use those to, you know, to sink from these tall. And so uh, for conservation status, this is a very, um, I mean, simplified, um, information, there's so much information out there, but in 1987, they were added to the endangered species list. And 1986, uh, the Bacconis Canyonlands Preserve was created um, for the protection of the warbler and uh, the vireo, as well as other um, things here that David covered. And then they were delisted in 2018 and they're currently listed as vulnerable. Um, so we continue to manage parts of the BCP for the vireos. So the preserve was created to offset other habitat that we lost. And the decision to delist was made based on the assumption that already protected habitat would continue to be protected. So even though um, they've been delisted, it doesn't mean that the threats aren't still there. Um, the primary threats are, of course, the loss of um, breeding habitat and this is through urban agricultural development and fire suppression. 
Um, I'll talk more about fire suppression and then uh, the brown headed coward parasitism. So it's not one or the other, it's, uh, it's both together. So fire suppression. Um, so fire was more common before people settled in Texas. Uh, it pushed back with this woody vegetation. And so with that fire land is it's lost through succession. So those shrubby shrubs and trees grow and they close off these open spaces. So we're not losing land in the sense that it's gone forever. We're losing it because it's, it's, um, it's aging, it's turning into forests. And then we've got some photos of some prescribed burns we've done um, on the preserve. Some of these are from Rimer's Ranch. And you can see how it's, you know, these are open areas and just fire coming through here. It just knocks, you know, the seedlings and things like that back and, and preserve those as open spaces. Um, I found this area of photo of the uh, April 2011 fire near Rimer's Ranch. Um, and so, I mean, it was, you know, it was devastating that it was a fire. It was not a prescribed fire, but um, you can see where, you know, it's, it's burning through. We can see from this area how these, um, these look like juniper and they look like they're, you know, it's, it's becoming forest. These, maybe these areas were more open and over time, you know, uh, the shrubby stuff grew and they start, you know, closing off. Um, so from fires and from prescribed burns at Rimer's Ranch, we've seen an increase in birds over the last, you know, few years. So um, how do we maintain this habitat? That's really uh, a big thing is uh, the restoration. Um, and it begins, you could say, before the arrival of birds or after the they leave um, for the season. And so we do mechanical and hand clearing. And this is this is what we're doing to mimic what fire does. You know, we can't always use fire, um, but we can use some of these tools that we have. And so like last year, we did a lot of hand clearing um, and we'd use everything from loppers and chainsaws to using the skid steer. And then later um, in the season, you know, when conditions were right, we were able to burn those brush piles that we had uh, made. Um, and so from this picture, you can see it, it kind of looks bad when you go out and you first, you know, use this big machinery and you're cutting things. It looks, I mean, it looks bad, you know, aesthetically it looks bad. But once, you know, spring comes, everything, it just comes back. Um, so here's some uh, Chinook that was, you know, maybe cut close to the ground and it's coming back. We've got, it, and it comes back um, shrubbier in these fuller shinneries. And so we've got these open spaces. You can see where some juniper was cut here. And then we've got these, uh, again, these shinneries. And they like that, that close ground cover. And we still, we keep some of those big trees, you know, because they need that too, they need that mix. Um, so the other uh, thread is the, the, the brown-headed cowbird. It is a native bird, um, but it doesn't build or a nest or rear young and all of their young are raised by other birds. Um, and they parasitize vero nests among um, other uh, types of songbirds. Um, ID wise, you know, here's the male, he's got that uh, brown head. Um, he's got that glossy black plumage and he's, you know, seven to eight, nine inches long. So he's, you know, much bigger than the four and a half inch uh, vireo. Um, the female is plain brown. Uh, she's six to eight inches. And I mean, historically, you know, these birds evolved together. Uh, they moved with the moving bison herds. But now, and so um, now that we don't have those herds coming through and the uh, cowbirds moving with them, now the birds are here and they're more concentrated. So the impact is felt more. So um, what happens? The and I refer to the it's BHCO. Uh, I'll refer to it as the cowbird. She lays her egg in the vireo nest, um, and sometimes she'll remove the, uh, one of the eggs uh, before laying her own egg. And she may also eat or damage the egg. So the cowbird 
hatches earlier than the vireo and it outcompetes it for food. So it's already growing and eating while the vireo is still in its egg. And here's, we have a photo. Um, it's the vireo nest and here is the black cat vireo. And then next to him, this huge bird is the cowbird. And so you could see that size difference already. And I mean, even the baby cowbird is, has been known to you know, push out its, its nest mates. So, I mean, why don't uh, the vireos do something about it, you may ask yourself. So the vireos may desert the nest and re-nest somewhere else. They might also throw out that cowbird egg, but there's a chance that the cowbird may return and destroy the nest. So few parasitized nests are successful, but a few parasitized nests are successful. And so our brown-headed cowbird management program um, occurs only during the breeding season uh, near varial breeding habitat. And the goal is to reduce parasitism rates. So I've shown a lot of photos and uh, how do we take these awesome images? And oh yeah, collect data in the process. Um, Dave went over a lot of the stuff, so um, I'm not gonna go through it again. But our efforts have shown that we have successful recruitment and successful productivity. And again, all season long, it's it, it's in co constant flux. We're collecting clues. Where it's we're really big on communication and collaboration. You know, it's we have all these birds that one person can't doesn't know all the information to. So we always have this intense discussions about their activity and um, especially when it comes to um, searching for nests um, or finding nests. Uh, we just we're constantly collecting information. Um, and there is no I in nest unless it's take a credit for finding one. So when uh, we we're doing big uh, various surveys and we come across a nest or uh, we follow the, the bird behaviors and and figure out where a nest is, we we flag um, some distance away from it and then we put this information, we've got the date, um, our GP, the bird from earlier, uh, maybe when we found it on today had two eggs in the shin oak and then we just give info on how to find it and then whoever found it gets to write their initials on the flag. So it's all good natured competition, but in the end we all win because knowing productivity numbers show us the health of the habitat. And so uh, nest building, the male may build a bachelor nest before the females even arrive or before he's paired up. Um, when they're paired up, they'll both visit possible nest sites um, and they, they should put on a fork terminal branch. You can see in this photo, here's the fork. Um, and it's mostly in those shinneries um, and they build about a meter off the ground, but we've seen them as high as, you know, two, two and a half meters. Um, and again, they both, they both help uh, find a site, but usually the female is the one who chooses where they're gonna uh, nest and does most of the building. Um, so egg, lay, egg laying, uh, the, she uh, lays an egg once a day and she has about three to four eggs. More commonly, we've seen four eggs in the nest. Incubation is 14 to 17 days and then time to fledge um, is 10 to 12 days. And that's when they leave the nest. Um, so threats to the nest include, you know, like Dave said, uh, different animals and the elements, as you can see from this photo, um, a storm came through and one of the other birds uh, fledged and then this guy stayed in the nest a little, like a day or two longer and then he also left the nest. So, uh, so here we have a, a male feeding a nestling and then in return, uh, he receives a fecal sac. You can see right here. And then the male either removes it from the nest or he eats it. And they remove um, or eat these to keep the nest tidy and to do, reduce the nest footprint. And so this is to reduce predation on the nest. And then I've got a couple of slides here. Um, uh, about nest ID. 
So we've got a nest here. It's got grass. It's got that uh, fork. It's got twigs. And this one is four inches across. And then here's uh, an aerial view of that. So this is not a vera nest. This is a northern cardinal. So when you're on the field and you see something from far away, you might be fooled into thinking it is and you get closer, you realize it's not. Um, some of them, like this one, you have to get up real close before you realize it's not. Uh, you got the Y-shaped fork. We've got that shinnery. Um, we've got moss in there and lichen. And then here's an, here's an aerial view. And again, this is not um, a vero nest or a black cat vero nest. It's a white-eyed vero nest. So this is one of the most, could be one of the most frustrating but rewarding parts of the job. Um, and then here we have another nest. We've got the Y fork, we've got spider web, um, lots of juniper bark. Uh, they use a lot of that in their nests. And then dry, just different dry veg matter. And here's an aerial view. Oh, and some fine, it's uh, the, the nest is lined with fine grass. And then we've got more spider web. They really love that spider web and use it type of glue to keep the nest together. And so this is the black cat vireo nest. And I've actually got a little beat up one. So it's, it's rather small, you know, it's like, it's in your hand. So, uh, so whenever we do find these nests, I just wanted to point out that sometimes we stumble on them. Sometimes we just pick up bird clues from uh, mapping um, the birds and we just do, we just try to do, be as um, as careful as we can around them and not try to, you know, overstress them if we're in an area. And then we, we, you know, we we mostly check them to, you know, check number the productivity. How many eggs uh, are there? Uh, have, were they successful? Is this nest parasitized? Um, things like that. Um, and then after the season's over, we take measurements. And then I'm going to end with a one more photo series. We have a, a female feeding a big caterpillar to a nestling. And then he <laughs> presents its fecal sac. And again, the female either removes it or she eats it. I just thought that was really interesting. Um, so a big, a very oh, big thank you for tuning in. And I'd like to do a shout out to our Bigby crew and our brave leader, Pop Shill. And here's my contact info if you have any other questions. All right. Well, thank you, Nancy and Dave. There was lots of great information there. Uh, we do have a lot of information or a lot of questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to start going through them. Uh, folks in the audience, if you have additional questions, pop them in the Q&A. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can, but we will be stopping promptly at 1 o'clock to preserve everyone's time. So the first one I'm gonna to direct towards Dave. Um, it's a two part question and it was offered, uh, it was asked several times. Um, it is, do the warbler wintering grounds require any specific vegetation like the ash juniper we have in central Texas? That was asked several times. And then also, is there any type of cooperation between us and the United States and the people who manage the wintering grounds in Mexico? Or do you know of any? Um. So yes to both, I suppose. So the habitats they use in Southern Mexico and uh, Central America, it's, it's more of a pine oak woodland. You know, I'm not really sure how much they'll venture out of that. You know, a lot of times they'll migrate kind of in mixed species flocks uh, when they're on their wintering grounds, you know, they'll be kind of in these smaller foraging flocks, maybe one or two warblers. You know, I think they've been observed up to you know, eight or nine warblers in a group, but usually it's just kind of like one or two mixed in with some other species. Um, yeah, from what I know, it, they're, they go up in the high country, you know, more elevation, more mountainous areas, that's kind of a pine oak woodland. And as far as cooperation uh, between um, wintering grounds in the United States, there are some, there are groups that do, um, that do a lot of work down in Mexico and Central America. Um, there, I wish I could name them offhand, but I know there's, um, uh, 
several groups coordinating with each other. I know a lot of universities in the States have researchers or funded research down uh, in the wintering grounds to try to, to try to track birds down there as well as kind of get an idea of habitat loss. And, you know, there's not a whole lot of information about where they are throughout their whole wintering grounds. They know where they are, but they don't call. They're really kind of scattered around. So they're really hard to track on their wintering grounds, but there are definitely researchers collaborating, um, trying to get an idea on what's happening. And Pro Natura Sur is one of the groups, I believe that does a lot of work in Mexico on that. Just to add a little bit. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, next one was asked why you were given your Golden Cheek Warbler talk, Dave. Do you know how long the typical male will live? Uh, maybe, maybe to add on that, what's the longest one that we've had returning that's been banded? The longest one I know about is has been, it was a banded bird so they could count. I think it was banded as like a second year bird. And I think it, it was either here or Fort Hood. The oldest one I know about is like nine years old, I think. Plus or minus eight to ten, I think he was nine. So that's a lot. The oldest one I think we've recorded. You know, usually most of our banded birds, you know, after they become five or six years old, if they start coming back, it's fairly rare. I think the longest running one we have on the BCP is Candy over at uh, is it um, Wild Basin? I think is where he keeps coming back to, and they call him Candy because he's got pink. <laughs> pink on his little, the bands on his feet. Um, and uh, yeah, what Kate just said something, I think nine years, she says, is how long he's been coming back. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. That's a lot of years to be making a journey that long. It's pretty, pretty neat for a little bird. Um, okay, next question is regarding tawny ants. Um, is what are they forage for? And then someone else asked like how they are, why are they a problem? What do they do for the birds? Uh, sure. So tawny crazy ants, I mean, they're, they're ants, they'll forage on anything they can get their hands on, but they, as far as I know, they, they forage on a lot of insects. Um, as I kind of touched on before, they're, they're a big concern because they're, there's a lot of them. Where they do get well established, I mean, they can form these huge colonies. I think one study estimated that pretty much all of Houston was like one giant tawny crazy ant colony because they're all interconnected underground and they have multiple queens. Um, they forage up in trees and so we're we're really concerned that they'll go in and they'll actually compete for food resources uh, for for warblers uh, you know warbler young are real dependent on like moth and butterfly caterpillars uh, you know like a month ago if you walked around in any kind of woodland you were just getting caterpillars in the face constantly that were hanging down on little threads um, you know, th those are super important for raising warbler young. So we're worried about if tawny crazy ants really become really established, you know, they're going to start competing for food resources for, with the warblers. Great. This next one's a pretty in-depth question. Um, so we'll see what we get into here. But um, is it true? Well, we can tell from your presentation that it kind of is that the, the golden cheek warbler and the BCBI like opposing habitat types. So how do how do we manage for both while displacing the other? How do you choose where your management is taking place? Right. I mean, on the BCP, I mean, I think we've, for the most part, we kind of have areas that we, that historically had vireos. And so we kind of continue to manage those areas for vireos. Um, you know, they do have conflicting habitat types. One's, you know, a younger successional shrubby mixed uh, height vegetation while warblers are mature oak gene for woodlands, but they can overlap. You know, I've seen roads and fence lines that that go through warbler habitat and those roads that were cleared out may only be 20 feet wide, but they're, they came back just full of shin oak. And so you'll just have like a line of black cat vireos in the middle of warbler habitat. So, I mean, you can have both overlapping. Um, you know, all of our vireo, for the most part, all of our vireo habitat is surrounded by warbler habitat. So we'll get warblers coming out into these open areas, you know, just to kind of forage or perch up in a tall oak tree and call. Um, so as far as what we choose to manage, you know, we, as far as vireos go, they're not listed anymore, but we, we are continuing to manage our kind of designated vireo 
habitat areas and we're going to continue to manage them for the areas. Um, and the ratio is, is pretty highly uh, leading towards the golden chick warblers, right? The vast majority of the habitat is golden chick warbler. Yeah. I mean, we're like, if, a, if we have golden cheek warbler habitat that's being used by golden cheek warblers, we're not going to tear it down and create vireo habitat. Uh, if we have areas that we do surveys and we see it's it's marginal habitat, there's no warblers using it, but it's full of shin oak, but it's just kind of overgrown. You know, we, after doing some surveys and deciding that the warblers aren't really using that, we may decide, you know, it'd be more beneficial to transition that into vireo habitat by either fire or mechanical means. Great. This next one uh, may be for Nancy. It's about the black cat vireo. Are you aware of any other preserves in Texas that are specifically to preserve the black cat vireo? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, David, do you know? I. I, I'm no expert. Like I said, this is my third bird season. I've done some reading for the presentation, but I don't. I don't want to answer and then not give you good information. Sure, I, yeah, I can. I can touch on that. Um, there's, you know, th there's a lot of areas that have a lot of warbler and vireo habitat, but that may not be their top priority. Um, like Fort Hood has a ton of warbler vireo and vireo habitat. And they manage for both of them. They have a really awesome program managing for both species, but you know, that it is a military base. So that's kind of what they do, but they have a ton of warblers and vireos. Um, Kerr, TPWD manages the Kerr, um, Kerr Wildlife Management Area. Uh, they have a very large vireo population. Um, you know, the Balcones Canyon Lands National Wildlife Refuge here just Northwest of town. They have a, they have a very healthy vireo they manage for warblers and vireos. They've done a ton of the area uh, habitat management, created a ton of area habitat. Um, let's see, I think Colorado Bend State Park has a bunch of vireos. Um, Devil's River State Park has a bunch of vireos. Um, so, so there's a lot of areas, yes. But those areas may not be managed, you know, specifically for them, but they have them and choose to manage for them and protect that habitat. Great, thank you. Um, okay, also asked several times, we, we anticipated this question coming up when you're talking about cowbirds. Um, can you briefly describe what are the control methods for the brown-headed cowbird? Uh, sure, so we, we run a series of traps. Um, you know, they're basically large, in, large caged enclosures. They're not really like a snap trap or anything like that. It's basically like a large, uh, six foot wide, six, seven foot tall, four foot wide cage. And it, um, we put seed down there and put black headed or brown head cowbirds in there and the cowbirds basically come in and then they can't get out the way it's kind of a, a funnel design. And so we, you know, we put those in areas where we're most likely to kind of find them. Usually it's up against areas that have cows or historically have cows. I think we're only running a handful of traps right now, three or four traps, kind of all, all, over, all over the Travis County side of the BCP. Great, thank you. All right, this question was also asked a couple of times. Um, and what happens to the BCP if the golden cheek warbler is delisted? Um, can you talk a little bit about perpetuity and how all that works? Uh, sure. So. So the BCP is set aside and protected in perpetuity, no matter if any of these species get delisted, our, our management goals don't change. Now we're actually going into the deeds of these properties that we get and ensuring that these properties are kept in conservation easements and kept protected, you know, in perpetuity. Like, um, so even if, um, you know, the gold cheek warbler were to lose federal protection, we wouldn't, you know, most of the time when species get delisted, one of the main principles of the delisting is that areas that are managing for habitat to protect habitat continue to do that. And that's one of the, you know, kind of reasons it gets delisted because they know that those areas can be protected for, uh, you know, a long time or forever. So, you know, that's very important to us is that even if species get delisted that we, our management principles don't change, we're gonna continue to protect these areas. 
Great. Um, so in addition to tawny crazy ants, how do fire ants play in, in the roads? Do you do any fire ant control? Yeah, the fire ants aren't as big a concern for warblers and vireos. Vireos maybe a little more so. There have been a couple, a couple of documented cases where fire ants will get up and, you know, uh, eat nests and stuff. Um, you know, we don't really see that that much on the BCP. Um, but fire ants are more of a concern. Uh, you know, if, if a nest gets forced fledged and a baby's on the ground, you know, it could get picked off by fire ants. But they're also a big concern for our karst features that we're trying to protect. So we'll we actually, it's it's kind of a full cycle deal. We there's a lot of cave crickets that bring a lot of nutrients into uh, our karst features, and those cave crickets will come out of those caves and forage at night outside. And so we're worried about the fire ants eating the crickets that are supposed to be bringing nutrients back into the cave. So we'll so some of our endangered species caves will actually go in and treat fire ant mounds. We actually pour boiling hot water on them since we can't use any chemicals. Uh, we'll wait until the queen and the eggs are close to the top and pour boiling water on them to try to kill the queen to try to kind of um, efficiently get rid of those or manage as many fire ants as we can. But it's kind of, a, it's hard. It's a never ending battle with fire ants. They just keep coming back, but you know, we do what we can. Cool. Um, all right, Nancy, I'm going to pick on you again because you were talking about the fecal sacs and uh, the Q&A started exploding about that. So several questions asked about, does the fecal sac make the, uh, eating it make the vireo sick? And then can you explain again why they eat them as opposed to, um, you know, throwing them out or, or just going outside the nest? Okay, so <laughs> sorry that I had some of these pictures. I was just obsessed with that once I learned about it. Um, I knew they removed, like the birds removed the, the fecal sacs from the nest, but I didn't realize that they would also maybe eat them. And so I think one of the questions was like, do they get sick? And it's, it's no, these are, these are baby birds that are being fed, you know, caterpillars and these, you know, these bigger things. And so they don't fully digest that. And so when they poop it out, that's, there's so many extra uh, nutrients in there that they just didn't, you know, take from that. And so the parents just, I mean, it's, they eat it. And then, so the parents don't have to like forage extra, like they don't go and eat their fill. And then, oh, also I need to feed my baby. They'll eat, you know, some stuff and then they'll like supplement it with the fecal sacs. So no, they, they don't, they don't get sick from that. Great, thank you very much. Okay, this next question, um, maybe more for Johanna um, as opposed to the biologist, but um, first she said, thank you for the interesting presentation. It says, do you think we will always have the BCCP and do you think the golden cheek warbler and black cat vireo will always be relying on it? Okay, so I'll take a shot at that. Um, so the BCCP uh, is the Balcones Canyonlands Conservation Plan, which is um, the agreement with, between US Fish and Wildlife and the city and county jointly um, to uh, comply with the Endangered Species Act by setting aside land in the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve as mitigation. So by setting aside this large chunk of really ideal habitat, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife allows, as, as David and, and Nancy mentioned earlier, allows for the development of um, endangered species habitat in Western Travis County, at least for the, the species that are covered by the BCCP. So the BCCP uh, has a 30 year um, permit time period um, and it was created in 1996. So that means that the permit expires in 2026. Um, so the BCP, the preserve itself, is um, protected in perpetuity because the habitat that was uh, removed in exchange for setting aside this preserve was removed permanently so that uh, other land that's mitigation for that needs to be preserved in perpetuity. However, the BCCP, that permit, um, which is the agreement between the federal and local entities, uh, when that expires in 2026, there is the option to uh, renew that with U.S. Fish and Wildlife in order to continue complying with the Endangered Species Act. Um, and so what that allows, the difference there is that that allows the continued mitigation um, for the removal of endangered species habitat. So 
for example, um, it's kind of, so I, I don't want to take too much time on this, but it's a little bit complicated. A lot of the private land developers who um, participate through the BCCP um, will work with the county or the city to determine how much um, they need to pay. Basically, it's essentially a, it's not a fee, but it's, um, it's sort of like a fee in lieu kind of situation where they will uh, pay a certain amount per acre according to how much habitat is on their acreage. Um, and then that money goes into the city and Travis County ability to uh, manage the preserve. Um, and so that sort of uh, mitigation process would go away if the uh, BCCP is not renewed. Um, private landowners would still have the option to work directly with US Fish and Wildlife in order to mitigate. But the difference is that the process is much longer. It's uh, years long instead of just a few weeks or, or some, in some cases, maybe a, a month or so with the uh, expedited process through the city and county. Uh, and also the benefit of having a habitat conservation plan like the BCCP is that you get the habitat together in these large chunks um, managed by these larger entities, whereas if landowners work directly with US Fish and Wildlife to mitigate, they generally have to set aside a portion of their actual property as preserved going forward, which is often difficult for landowners to manage uh, habitat uh, for endangered species if that's not something that is, you know, in their usual wheelhouse. And it also fragments that habitat into lots of different pieces instead of having it consolidated in the BCP. So just to sum it all up, the BCP will continue in perpetuity. The BCCP expires in 2026. Um, and we are currently in the city and county pursuing renewal with the US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and so what would go away if that were not renewed is that expedited uh, mitigation process, not the preserve itself. So that's a little clearer than, than mud. <laughs> <laughs> Good, though. yeah, it's a very complicated process. But we still, unfortunately, we have lots of questions left, but that is our hour, and we're going to um, wrap it up there for everyone's time. I just want to say thank you to both Dave and Nancy for your presentation.